Welcome to a special Mother's Day episode of the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast. We're sharing hopeful stories of people impacted by disability and answering your questions about how to welcome families with special needs in your church and community. I'm your host, Crystal Keating, and today I'm joined by a very special mother, Cynthia Berry. Now, Cynthia has definitely faced a series of challenges. She's a single mom, an African-American woman, and a mother of a child with special needs. But her journey through each of these challenges, especially her son's disability, has given her such a deep faith in Jesus. She's learned to see her son for who God created him to be. And through each challenge, Cynthia has learned the importance of community, especially her church community. Listen now as Cynthia shares her story of hope. Well, I am so excited to be celebrating Mother's Day today as I sit down and talk with my friend and well-respected coworker, Cynthia Berry. Welcome to the podcast, Cynthia. Well, thank you, Crystal. It's so great to be here with you. Thank you. Well, I feel the same. It's great to be with you. And Cynthia, it's a true honor to speak with you today and spend this time talking about your life as a single mother mm-hmm. to two children, one of whom was born with a developmental disability. Would you share what life was like in the earlier years of raising your children, especially your son, Seasway? What was your life like as a mother back then? Well, Seasway, of course, uh, at three, was diagnosed with pervasive development disorder, Mm. and that's on that spectrum of autism. Mm. Uh, But life for me was, I was a trilogy. Mm. I'm a single mom, I'm a special need parent, and I'm an African-American woman. Mm. And so in that context, uh, the only way I was really able to survive was to uh, seek community. There's no way that I would have been able to walk that path, a very difficult path, yet a very profound path that drew me nearer to Jesus that I was able to connect in a community that loved me, that, that, that took my son and my daughter in their arms and, and treated them like sons and daughters. Days when I could barely make it because of living the, the day in and the day out mm. with disability, that they took C's way and would care for him. Mm-hmm. And, and I was able to have a respite, if you will. And this community was the church. Hmm. Now, this church didn't really have a disability ministry, but it had this great love. Hmm. This love, like the, if I were to compare it to the first church, the first church where everyone uh, had a need met, you right. know, the, the blind, the lame, the widow, everyone was cared for it on the same level. And those that had means... They were called and, and, and commissioned to take care of the least, and, and I was the least mm. in that community. I think so many families affected by disability long for something like that. Absolutely. You know, one scripture that, that really kept me going was Psalm 63, 8. It says, my soul clings to you. Mm. Your right hand upholds me. And in those times when my hands started failing— being a single mom for so long, the Lord, by His Word and His promise, just took me to a whole different place, my perspective. It wasn't any more about disability, but it was more about leaning on Him mm. to solve and resolute in this unusual family that was precious. And, and I saw people come around me uh, that, you know, doctors and, and uh, people in profession and who were able to draw Seasway in and provide interventions for free, uh, wow. you know, uh, speech and language therapy, uh, uh, UCLA, I diagnosed and, and, and looked at his brain to see how it functioned and gave all kinds of input of how he could grow and thrive and and, and be the best sees way he could be. Absolutely. You know, Cynthia, can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges that you were facing as a single mother through that time? 
what were your days like? You know, uh, in that singular uh, environment, it's just me. I really had no one to defer to. It's a lot of pressure. And in the home, it was consistently his temper tantrums, his meltdowns, his his sleepless nights. Mm. And that meant that my daughter, Brooke, was sleepless. That meant Mm. I was sleepless. Mm. Uh, Didn't always have the strength to calm the environment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would self-isolate. Because I didn't want to bother my family, who was tremendous. I didn't want to bother that community that, that, that was a part of the church. Because I was guarding myself. I was guarding Seasway from, from having to be in an environment where he just loses it. And I was guarding my daughter from shame. From feeling like, you know, she was powerless. And this was day in and day out. Mm. So you kind of stayed at home, wanted to keep a distance from the community because you were, in a sense, trying to guard your family. Yeah. But that really put a burden on you because you were really lonely. I was very lonely. And and, and that loneliness was was so deep at times that there were times I spiraled into depression Mm. and really didn't know a way out. But I tell you, I I found, Crystal, that the more I pressed into that community, the less depressed, the less isolated I became. And if I had anything to say to friends and family who are affected by disability Mm -hmm. and living with disability Mm -hmm. and and the toughness of disability, don't isolate. Mm. Don't self-isolate. Do all you can to, to transplant yourself in community, even when it's uncomfortable. Because our goal is to teach others about disability, what a family who is living with disability looks like. And it also brings a wholeness. I love what Johnny always says, no man is an island. Right. And on that island, there are dark places. But when you're have the courage to come out of that dark place into a light. It's like an iron sharpening iron. Mm. And, and, and that's what happened in my life. Uh, the more I was in community, the more I felt vibrant, and the, the more hope rose. And the more I knew that I had a story that, that people needed to hear. And there are other families that have stories that people need to hear because it brings hope. Absolutely. Well, and especially with the kind of community that you were surrounded with, a community that loved the Lord, they weren't thinking about their own needs, but considering your needs and the needs of Seasway and your daughter, Brooke. What's lovely about it is I would say in the communities where I'm from, there is a mentality of of the village. Mm. That we cannot get along or we cannot move forward in life without a village. Right. Without that love, without that uh, even chastisement (laughs) and correction. Encouragement not to give Mm. up. Yeah. You know, encouragement of of okay, let's 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 cut the pity party. Let's move to a place where uh, we can help you. You're not alone in this. Right. Encouragement to continue to, to, to lean into the Lord and, and, and not let the circumstances of life keep us in one place. Mm-hmm. It was a loving, like the Father, like our Heavenly Father that gives us that, that loving nudge right. uh, to move forward and to continue to press on. Right. We need other people speaking truth into our lives. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Cynthia, I know that you weren't always a single mother. At one point... You were married. Yes. Can yes. you talk a little bit about your marriage and did disability affect your marriage? You know, I, I, I still ponder that today. I would say that what disability does, it, it creates a, a, a wall that's unknown. And that unknown wall becomes such the central focus in the home that a marriage can, can be at risk of not being cultivated mm. and not being uh, uh, nurtured. Mm. And in the midst of that, I, I, I think that, you know, my former spouse 
didn't see the reality of disability. He really thought that Seasway would just grow out of it. Mm. And so the perspective of, of needing intervention, and of course prayer being that supernatural intervention, and then mm. the practical things that, that, that was needed, he didn't really see that vision. So in reality, I was in a singleness in the midst of relationship. That's incredibly lonely. And that is lonelier than being single in the midst of, of particularly when you have challenges such as we had. Right. And then one day, um, he just didn't want to be married anymore. Mm. And I had to reconcile with that. I, I searched scripture to find it. Okay, what am I to do? Mm. And uh, what, what I landed on is that I needed to release if he did not want to remain. Mm. How did your community respond to you at that point? Quiet. I would say um, <laughs> invisible rocks being thrown, um, not really knowing what to say. Yeah. And then there were those that broke that line of silence and reached out to um, be a part of our lives in a way mm. that would walk us through the journey of, of mm. being just this threesome. Mm. And it, it was, you know, it had its ebb and flow, but, but God's greatness was still shown in it. Right. What do you feel like you wish you would have had in those times? I think direct counsel. Okay. I would say that direct counsel and having someone walk alongside, whether it's a, a pastor or a marriage mentor, or that that, that was needed. You really didn't have that as much mm. as, as we do today. Mm-hmm. And and for me, I would say that that would have been a, a, a blessing and could have changed the trajectory, but who knows? Right. Right. And, and yet, you know, you talked about even in that sense of loneliness that you're going directly to God mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and feeding on Him because yeah. He is your shepherd and He is your guide and yeah. God has given us people to do that. And yet I can see how those things were laying the foundation for what would become a constant reliance upon him, yes. always going to him first. And that's what I see about you. Thank you. And I just appreciate that. It's such an encouragement to me. Thank you. You know, I I don't even know if I could wake up in the morning without him. Mm. I don't even know if I can make decisions that I make without him. Yeah. Because I've seen him in, in the tilling of my soil, of the land that he gave me, at work constantly. Right. You know, the simplest things, the needs my children have, and that a single mom, you know, there's always a, a financial um, challenge. Right. But those little things, like going to Disneyland, you know, it, it was the congregation that showed up one day at the door and said, hey, we got tickets for your kids. It's like... <laughs> Okay. Oh. You know, it's the simple Not things. Not just God the needs, but the wants, right? The wants yeah. and the needs and, 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 and what we don't even know we need. Yes. The Lord was there, is there. Uh, he's my all in all. Mm-hmm. He is. He's so faithful. Well, Cynthia, kind of turning a different corner, you know, as an African-American woman, I'm just curious about the challenges many minorities face when they're impacted by disability. Can you talk about some of those challenges they face as they raise children who have disabilities? And on the flip side, what are some of the strengths that you have seen in the minority community when it comes to caring for families affected by disability? You know, I I think in the minority community, the biggest hindrance is the lack of resources. Mm or the knowledge that the resources exist. Mm. Uh, many times, families, I would say, in, 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 in areas that are economically challenged, mm-hmm. they are not aware what they have access to. And because of that, they're raising their children in a way that, that really keeps them at a just a basic level. You know, they don't have the opportunity to provide or give a mission statement for their children. Mm. Like my mission statement for Seasway was that he will live at his most excellent level. I love that. 
and 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 whatever that level is and so then there's a decrease in hope and so this person with a disability there's no vision for them and, and it's because families in the minority community don't realize and have the access to the resources right Right. But at the same time, they have a love. They have a love that is is profound to see, that they love their their family and they love their loved one who, who is living with disabilities. But on the other hand, I think that that community, it just goes back to uh, the neighbor, loving your neighbor. Right. They help each other. Oh, yeah. They help each other with a commitment that I have never seen. Mm. Unless I go internationally, mm. I see it. Mm. But in these communities where poverty exists and disability is present, they just are so connected. Right. You know, we have to look at one another's community and say, what are others doing that we can really grow from mm-hmm. and learn from? Mm-hmm. Every community has different strengths. Yeah. And I think drawing on those strengths are important. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, I would love to see us reach into those churches, those ethnically diverse churches, and begin to teach what the Bible says about disability, the heart of God, about how He loves uh, yes. those who, who are weak, and that our weakness works best through God and His strength, and, and, and to be able to re- have a renewed hope that, that, that my son or my daughter or my husband or my wife, who's living with a disability, can live at her or his fullest capacity absolutely, and bring glory to the Lord's name. Well, I love your perspective on the church and the various communities that come alongside one another, that that sort of village mentality. We're in Mm -hmm. this together. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have some stories that really (laughs) impacted your own life, kind of turned a corner for you even. Oh, yeah, I do. You know, I remember singing in the choir at church. And Seasway, because he didn't have any sense of socialization, he came darting down the middle of the aisle and rolled under the piano in the midst while we were singing. (laughs) And the piano player kept on playing. (laughs) The preacher kept on preaching. And Seasway is yelling and screaming and rolling under the piano. And I looked up and I'm thinking, okay, should I get out of my choir robe and go down and, and pick him up? And then I saw a woman just politely get up. She was 80. She crawled (laughs) under the piano, (laughs) grabbed Seasway, and sat him on her lap. And he was so calm Mm. throughout the whole service. Mm. And and that's when I realized, okay, God, I don't always have to strive in this. Right. Because disability can cause us to strive. Mm. But you got this, and you're using the hands and feet of other people to make things okay. Absolutely. There was another story I remember. Oh, I had to go to the church, and we had just painted the sanctuary beautiful white. I came in the sanctuary, and Seasway had painted a black blob <laughs> on a white wall. Oh, no. And my pastor called uh, me from, a, from, a, uh, from home, actually, because he was at Vacation Bible School. And he said, I have something to tell you. And I was like, okay. He said, well, Seasway painted a black blob, and we're going to get the paint. And we'll, I said, no, let me come down, and then I am going to have Seasway paint it. Mm. So when I came down and I looked at that black blob, tears began to stream from my eyes. Because I saw something that I hadn't seen before, and that... That black blob was saying, can't you see me? Mm. Can't you see me? I'm crying out, can't you see me? And it ministered to my heart that my son had no language until he was seven. Mm. But that black blob meant that I'm in darkness. Mm. Can't you see me? Mm. And so we together restored that wall to white. But it left an imprint on my heart that, yeah, Jesus sees you. Oh, yeah. I see you. And I'm going to advocate for you so that others will see you. Yeah. 
because you have a purpose. Absolutely. And, you know, I know that your heart is always, let's see my son through God's eyes. And I, I remember you kind of telling me a story where it was a switch for you, where you were sort of focused on his disability, but then you moved from that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember most of the time I was parenting Seasway's disability. I was not parenting the boy. I was not parenting the gifts that God did give him. I was parenting the disability. And the change for me was when one of our elders said, this is a boy. You have to begin to parent him as his mother. God has a plan for him. And when she said that, I have to admit I got a little offended. (laughs) But then as I began to really look at that, it came true that I was parenting the disability. Mm. You know, I, I would do things to make sure he didn't have a meltdown. You know, we're going to go over here so he would, you know, it was all of this busy, fearful parenting mm. versus parenting him as this is a young man that God has fearfully and wonderfully made, that he has created him for a purpose. And I need to seek the Lord for that purpose Mm. and parent Seasway David Mabua Mm. and not his disability because Mm -hmm. that's just a, that is only a symptom of what God has created him to be. Did you see a change in him after you kind of shifted that perspective? I mean, Cynthia, you were doing the best you could with what you had. Yeah, I did. As time went on, his temper tantrums decreased. As time went on, he was more structured and not out of control. And then at seven years old, he spoke first time. And the first word he said was, Mom. Mm-hmm. That, that was his first word. Mm-hmm. And it was there I started to see the promises of God because God always assured me that Seasway would be in his right mind by 10. Wow. And then he began to speak. He began to engage in school. He began to uh, be a part of uh, programs that, matter of fact, we realized that he had this gift for theater. We realized he had a gift for singing. Everything extraordinary about him. We began to see it. Came to life. It came alive. Mm. When a child finds language, it just opens up the world to them. Yeah, it does. You know, and I realized, Crystal, that his language, when he didn't have it, was behavior. That was his language. He was trying to communicate He was something. trying to communicate. He didn't have any verbal mm. context. Mm. He only had physical context. But this is hindsight for me. Right. Because then I was too engaged and too wrapped up and in this storm that I couldn't see Mm. that he was desperately wanting to communicate Mm. how he was suffering. Mm. But now, you know, he can talk. I get choked up when I think about it because my eyes have seen the glory of God through my son. son. Mm My relationship with Jesus is deep like it is because I went through a journey of disability. Mm. And I'm grateful. I wouldn't change it. Mm. I would change it. Cynthia, as you think about other families, even single moms, single dads who are going through the journey that you've gone through these past 24 years— What kind of encouragement or advice do you have for them? I think the biggest thing is just that don't don't let go of God's hand. Mm. And if you don't know him, get to know him. Mm -hmm. Because he could take your nothing and make it into something. Absolutely. And so I would say, parents, advocate for your children. Be open and and don't isolate. Mm -hmm. And your greatest weapon is community. That's good advice, Cynthia. So you were also raising a daughter, Brooke. Yes. And I think we often 
not forget about the siblings, but so much attention and energy is given to the child with a disability. Talk about life for Brooke. What were family dynamics like back then? Yeah, because Seasway absorbed the environment, and I kid you not, I have to say that I was not aware of Brooke's suffering Mm. because she never really expressed it. Just a, a wonderful help when we needed to assist Seasway. But I remember one day when uh, Seasway was trying to tell me something, and because his language, even when he got language, it was difficult to understand. Mm. And uh, But he kept saying, I want her to be my sister. I want her to be my sister. And I'm thinking, okay, she's your sister. And, and then the Lord just gave me wisdom. And what he was really saying, I need Brooke to treat me as her brother. Mm. So I went in Brooke's room, not really knowing what to say, and I, and I said to her, I said, Brooke, Seasway was saying that he really want you to be his sister. Do you know what that means? And she just started crying, mm. crying profusely, and she said, I can't take my brother to the games like my friends, and I can't take him to the movies like they bring their their brothers and sisters, and I, and I can't because Seasway just won't act right. Mm. She's and it was that then all I realized she'd been keeping that in. Mm. She had questions that she was afraid to ask mm. because she may have thought it wasn't a you know it wasn't fair. Mm. Yet she was suffering too, mm. and that family dynamic is real. Mm. And today they are the best of friends. God gave us grace to give us, a, a, all three of us, understanding that we were really impacted by something. Because you oh, yeah. go in survival mode, you right. don't realize right. how you're impacted emotionally, socially, mentally, physically. Mm. But the Lord made us very aware. And then we became very intentional as a family. Mm. What did that look like for you, being intentional at that point? Taking Brooke on dates, giving her her time. Having Seasway literally wait so that I could spend time with Brooke, Mm. engage him in things that would interest him in the time, Mm. and not make it all about him. And Mm. I think that that switch from from, uh, parenting his disability was how we were able to navigate differently. Right. The perspective of the household wasn't all about disability. Mm. It was about family. Yeah. It was about learning Jesus. Yeah. It was about having a little fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah, when you're in survival mode, you lose that sense that you there's life outside of disability. Yeah, you do. Okay, now Seasway is 24, mm-hmm. and he has a remarkable life. Yes, I want to. I want to hear about him. What's well? What's you, he living like now? I mean, large. He's living <laughs> large. Uh, Seasway has his own car. Seasway is attending Moore Park College, taking technical theater. He just got his certification in technical theater, and we're going for the 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 AA. Uh, he will need some. Uh, tutoring and intervention in that. He has an internship that he's working for a theater, a small theater in Thousand Oaks, and he is uh, running the lights. Mm. And how that happened, running (laughs) lights and sound, that all happened in the church. Really? He was asked to be a part of the children's ministry, and he started running their soundboard. And so that there is what made him go into That's how he learned to do it? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, and it sounds like he was interested in that kind of he thing was interested earlier in on. Yes. The church yes. gave him a job. The church gave him a, a, a potential vocation. Yeah. Skills. Yeah. So that's how that happens. So he's, he's, doing, he's good. doing well. He is, he is a very tall man. Yes, he is. He's 6'4". <laughs> I look up to him. <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. Oh. I mean, it just blows me away what God has done. With your family and with your son. And, and Cynthia, last year, you went through your own really deep health challenges. Last year, you had brain surgery. Yes. Uh, they had identified a, what looked like a tumor, and they weren't sure. And when they went in, they found that it was sarcoidosis, which is a autoimmune disease, which I had pulmonary, but couldn't figure out how it went to the brain. But... 
with that, uh, they removed it. Uh, I still don't have feelings. I'm still mm. uh, uh, living with sarcoid. And, um, but the Lord is faithful. But what I have found, Crystal, is that I've been a, in a sustained stress mode mm. for 17 years. Mm. And the stress mode, I, I wasn't aware that I was stressed. Mm. It's just the singleness of life, uh, the parenting of a, a child with a disability, mm. and, and also trying to move my daughter along in life, mm. and then my own life that that sustained stress had impact on my physical body. Yeah. All while providing financially, yes, working yes. full time. Yes. And so that that is the aftermath, but even that I'm grateful that that the Lord saw fit what he's saying is I want you to stop striving. Mm. Well done. Now stop striving and I I'm going to take the driver's seat. And that that is where I am today. And I'm um, happy to be alive. You know, I, now I'm living with disability. Right. But, but God has shown himself once again faithful. Yes, he is. Well, Cynthia, our time is about to wrap up, but I have one last question for you. You're a seasoned mother now. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you wish you would have known back then that you'd like to share with all the mothers and fathers and families listening today? Mm-hmm. I think what I would have loved to know back then was how God was able to take everything that I am and make it out of something. Mm. And if we completely rely on self, which he does want us to participate, we will make it. And in the beginning, that's how I was operating. And what I know now is that he resoluted for me all these years. Mm. And I would say parents... Let the Lord resolute for you. Mm. Be engaged in community and know that his hand is a part of that community. Don't self-isolate because in that isolation, the enemy will destroy you. Mm. Amen. Cynthia, thank you so much. You are a blessing to me. And I thank you so much for your time and for being so open. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to be with you today. I love what Cynthia shared today. No one is an island. And as a single mom, she was doing the best she could with what she had. And God used the hands and feet of her church community to help provide for her needs, also her wants, and what she didn't even know she needed. Community is so vital, and what a gift of community we have through the church. If you feel overwhelmed by the challenges you're facing today, please take Cynthia's advice and don't self-isolate. Find your community. God gave us the local church to be a community of Christian support to help provide for each other's needs. And as Cynthia shared, for families impacted by disability, community is especially vital. If that's you, take Cynthia's advice and press into your church community, even when it is uncomfortable. You have a story of hope that needs to be shared. And if you are looking to provide a community of support for families impacted by disability, please visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to download our free book, Doing Life Together. This free book offers practical tools for churches and individuals to help meet real needs, build community, and remove some of the isolation that families impacted by disability often experience. Doing Life Together also shares some of the unique ways that disability affects each member of the family, parents, spouses, siblings, and grandparents. We know that community is so important for everyone. So please download Doing Life Together at johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. Thank you for listening and join us again next week as we hear from two of my friends, Ariel and Jace. They'll be sharing about the life-changing experience they had serving families impacted by disability at Family Retreat. So subscribe on your favorite podcasting app or visit us at johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to find any of the resources that have been mentioned. You can also hear about our latest initiative, May Match, Your Gift Multiplied, and send me your comments. I would love to hear from you. I'm Crystal Keating, and thank you for listening to the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast.